This is Paul Schmid. Welcome to the Pursuit Zone. My next guest found himself at a crossroads after leaving his corporate job and splitting up with his wife. Instead of taking the path of the stereotypical midlife crisis, he opted for the path less traveled and decided to take a walk. Not just any walk, a really long walk. A 1,305 mile walk across Turkey. For 20 years, Matt Krause had something bigger in mind. And this walk would be the first part of that bigger thing. Check out Matt's journey at heathenpilgrim.com. Matt Krause, welcome to the Pursuit Zone. Thank you. It's good to be here. I enjoyed reading your blog, Matt. You would left a lot of breadcrumbs around about your background, but I want to have you explain your background to me. First question is, where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in uh, two places, both on the U.S. West Coast. And the first was in California. I was born in the Bay Area. And then we moved uh, inland to a small farming town called Reedley, which is about, uh, you know, at the time it was 10, 15,000 people. And then lived in that area until I was 15. And then we moved up to Washington State. My dad got a job up in Washington State, not Seattle, but eastern Washington. And we lived in uh, another small town called Yakima, about 40,000 people. And then I went to uh, a university in Chicago and then on to adult life. So it was, uh, so I grew up in the U.S. U.S. West Coast. Did your father have anything to do with farming? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in fact, that's, that's been the core of his job for my entire life. So I noticed a lot of the photographs and the discussion on your blog around um, pictures of fields and what was planted. Yeah, you know, uh, a lot of those pictures, well, I, I was thinking of my dad when I took them and uh, before the trip, uh, while I was doing the research, I was using Google Earth and the satellite photos on Google Earth to research the trip. And and so I would show those to my dad and he would his, his eyes would light up because he would see, ah, that's that's how people in another part of the world farm. And uh, so he said, be sure when you are out walking to and you see those fields up close and for real to take plenty of pictures and send them to me. How did you end up in Istanbul the first time around? Oh, the first time around, yeah. Well, that was in 2003. And uh, in 2003, I was flying from the U.S. to Hong Kong, and I was going on business. And I met a woman who was also flying from the U.S. to Hong Kong, also on business. And uh, she, she lived in California. She was a Turk, but she lived in California. And we just hit it off and then uh, started going out after we got, both got back to the U.S. And then later that year, she said, I'd like to move to Istanbul because that's where she's from. She's from Istanbul. Her family's from Istanbul and she grew up in Istanbul. And uh, so I said, well, I'll, I'll go with you. I was ready to leave my job and, and I was ready to... Uh, Actually, I kind of already left my job, and and I was ready for something else. So I came to Istanbul with her, and we that was in 2003. And we got married in 2006. We, we split up in 2009. Uh, that means I was in Istanbul for six years. And did you do any work when you were in, while you were in Istanbul? Yeah, I did two things. Uh, the first was uh, w when I stepped off the plane back in 2003, I didn't have any idea what I was going to do. Uh, all I knew was I had some money from personal savings and I was going to live off of that for a while. But I, I pretty much stepped off the plane and started looking for something to do just so I wouldn't be bored. And uh, after looking around for about three months, two or three months, I found uh, some jewelry and realized that um, I could sell jewelry uh, from Turkey to the U.S. And so I, I set up a website and I sold that online on a website from 2004 until we got married in 2006. And then the, the business had kind of you know plateaued early and, and 
I was basically working for free. The business was paying its expenses, but it wasn't paying me any money. So after we got married, then I switched and I started teaching English, just private freelance lessons. And after about a month, I quickly fell into a niche, which was a, a higher paying niche. And now it's, you know, in 2013, it's heavily occupied, but back then it was a niche. So I did that for three years, teaching English and private lessons. Uh, so I had two jobs in my first, first go around in Istanbul. So let's fast forward now mm-hmm. three years, right, to 2012. Okay. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. And somehow this seed for this, the idea for this walk gets into your head. How did that happen? <laughs> well, it, it kind of happened. A bunch of things came together at once. I had a, a window in which I could do something unusual, and that window did not exist before, and it did. It might not exist in a couple of years. It existed at that time, and so I figured, well, I I, I better jump through the window. And one of the or a couple of the key factors in that window opening for me one was my my wife and I split up, and in, in 2009. I had gone back to the U.S. to because we were we were both going to move to the U.S. and my job was to go to the U.S. as kind of the advanced crew and to you know find a job and get set up with a house and all that and then my wife would come join me and when the time came when when I had the job and I had the house and it was time for my wife to come join me uh, she, she decided that she she wasn't going to come join me. And so we split up, and that was a, a really big part of the window opening for me. One, it was a personal window, or in a couple ways it was a personal window, in that I couldn't have done something like walk across Turkey when I was married, and uh, I also wouldn't have really wanted to. I would have other things I wanted to do. Uh, and another thing that... Uh, was a big contributor to that window opening for me was uh, I didn't really like my job and I was a supply chain manager for a kitchenware company. So my job was to basically take some new piece of kitchenware that we designed and find a factory in China to make it for us. And I had done that work before. Uh, I had done that work 10 years before, uh, before I went to Turkey the first time. I didn't really like it the second time around and I was really bored with it. But it served a purpose when my job was to come to the U.S. and get a job and start making some money and set up a you know nest for my wife to come join me. And then when she didn't come join me, then the job that I didn't really like didn't really serve a purpose anymore. So my marriage was ending, and uh, I didn't like the job that I had taken, and so I had a window in which I could do something unusual. How are you beginning to plan this out? What are you thinking about? Mm-hmm. How are you physically preparing? What's yeah. what's happening? Well, there was nine months between the time that I decided I'm going to walk across Turkey and the day that I actually started. So there were nine months. And, and during that nine months, I was still in the U.S., but I had left Seattle and I went back and uh, lived with my parents, which was really nice because... I hadn't seen them for my entire adult life, or I mean, I had seen them, but just, you know, once or twice a year and just for a few days at a time. And during that nine months, I was just occupying myself with a couple things. One was earning the the first half of of the bankroll that I would need for the walk. And to do that, I did some work in the fields since, you know, my dad is in farming and since it's a farming area, uh, he's he's got a lot of connections. And so when when it comes to you know, hey, I need to do some grunt work in the fields to earn a few extra bucks. Can you hook me up? I have good connections for that. And another thing that I was doing was uh, researching the route. So I would spend about an hour a day, you know, over that half year, eight month period, just researching the route. Where am I going? Let's look at it on Google Earth. You know, what are the the distances? Where are the villages? What are the elevations? What time of the year will I be there? Stuff like that. And then uh, another thing that I was doing uh, during that period of time before I came to Turkey was I was walking uh, about, I think it was 2,000 kilometers, so 
1,200 miles. I walked uh, about 1,200 miles in the U.S. just to make sure that my body was up to the task of walking across the country. I had, you know, four or five routes around this small town of Reedley, and I would just walk those routes over and over and over, you know, one each day, uh, just to make, just to put in my time walking and make sure that my body was up to the task. You make it to Turkey. How many days mm-hmm. go by before you uh, start walking? Okay, well, I was in, uh, I was in Turkey for uh, two weeks before I went to uh, uh, the town of, of called Kushadasa to start the walk. So I was in Istanbul for two weeks before I started the walk. I came in August, which the, the last part of August, which is the lowest point of the year uh, here in Istanbul. A lot of people in Istanbul just kind of leave the city and, you know, they go to the coast or they, that's the vacation month. So I saw some people who I hadn't seen in a long time, which was really nice, you know, to come here and see old friends. But I also met a lot of new people because, you know, the, a lot of the old people who I knew, they, they were gone for that two-week period. And so I met a lot of new people, some of whom, you know, have become my friends since then. Uh, and now that I'm back in Istanbul, I get to see them and spend time with them. But basically, that's what I was doing for the first two weeks was just kind of hanging out and uh, getting ready, you know, last minute details and uh, meeting some new people. And were you telling them about your what you were going to do? Yeah, yeah. I, I told them about what I was going to do. And uh, the evolution of how people have responded has, has kind of changed over time. Before I did the walk, I, I would tell people what I was going to do. And their response was, wow, that's really cool. Uh, good luck. Uh, but, but because, you know, it's like, oh, I have a big dream and I haven't even really started it yet. So, you know, what are people going to say besides, ah, oh, well, good luck with that. Let me know how it goes. And then, you know, during the walk, I would tell people what I was doing and their response changed. It was, wow, uh, you really mean, mean business. You're, you're actually going to do this or you are actually doing this. As I finished the walk, and for the first month after I finished the walk, you know, people's response was, wow, that's really cool and inspiring. Uh, that must be an amazing experience. Tell me more about it. But that fades quickly. And, and now here, here I am about two, two and a half months after the walk. And often people's re- response is just, oh, wow, uh, that's interesting. What are you going to do for me now? <laughs> <laughs> So kind of take me through the overview of the walk in terms of the geographical areas of Turkey that you're walking through. You're starting in the west, is that correct? Yeah, I started in the west uh, on the Aegean coast. And uh, Turkey is kind of like a, shaped like a horse's head. It's uh, kind of like a, a rectangular, uh, or a rectangle laying down on one of its long sides. And so uh, I started on the, in the west, uh, where Turkey runs into the Aegean Sea. And I uh, started in a town called Kushadasu, which is a, a big tourist town. It's during the off season, you know, its natural population is about 60,000 people. And then during the uh, tourist season, you know, during the summer uh, and late summer, uh, the population, you know, doubles or triples. And uh, so I started there. And that was on the whole walk. That was the only place that I had been. All all of the other places that I went on the whole, you know, seven and a half month walk were were new to me. And so from uh, from Kushadasu on the Aegean coast, I just basically walked east, walking along the highways uh, to Konya, which is kind of like the 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 Omaha of Turkey. It's a relatively small provincial town. It's about one million people. And it's a you know fairly conservative place, and in fact, uh, it has the reputation in Turkey of being the most religiously conservative town in Turkey. I incidentally arrived in Konya on the biggest religious holiday in the Muslim calendar. Uh, they s- definitely celebrated it a little differently than uh, people do here in Istanbul. Uh, and then from from Konya, then I walked to the southeast to uh, the uh, Mediterranean coast. And for a week or two, I was walking along the Mediterranean coast. And then I uh, went inland. The The eastern half of Turkey does not have a coast. And so once I reached that point, 
uh, the halfway mark of the walk. Then I spent the last half of the walk uh, continuing east, uh, walking past the uh, the Syria border. And then uh, when I passed the, uh, the Iraq border, I was further north, so I didn't really see much of any, you know, the border was a long ways away at that point. And then I continued east and finished near this, a city called Vaughan. Vaughan is a city of about 100,000 people. It's the provincial capital of the capital of Vaughan. And then I f- finished at the Turkey-Iran border about 60 miles east of Vaughan. And that was uh, in mid-April, the 13th of April to be exact. Did you feel safe during your travels? Yeah, uh, I didn't really know. I, I did feel safe, and, and I didn't really know what to expect uh, before the walk. So there was a lot of unknowns for me. My biggest fear, actually, before the walk, my biggest fear was uh, scorpions. And uh, on my entire, I don't know why I picked scorpions, but that was my irrational fear. I was sure that if I was going to die on the walk, it was going to be at the because of the sting of a scorpion. Uh, I didn't actually see any scorpions, not even one on the walk. The only human danger that I ever had or that I was ever aware of was a couple times people, uh, they tried to rob me, but I I I have to put, you know, quotation marks around that word rob because they were so polite about it that they just walked alongside me and asked. You know, it's like I would have a, a pair of sunglasses and uh, that I was wearing and somebody, one, one of these two people, you know, they would ask me, uh, can I have your sunglasses? So I have to put quotes around the word rob. The, the, so I didn't see, so my biggest fear was scorpions. I didn't see any of those. And uh, human danger, I didn't really have any human danger at all. My biggest danger was just getting hit by cars and uh, just trying to stay, you know, I was hiking along the, the, the highway that was my biggest danger was on, especially when the road or the shoulder was narrow, just not getting hit by cars. Were there any close calls? Uh, for getting hit by cars? Yes. Yeah, uh, there, a couple times. Uh, but it was just, uh, basically it was uh, truckers playing. And uh, especially at the beginning of the walk, you know, before I learned uh, the, the technique of... So, of, so wait, wait, you mean they were messing with you? Yeah, they were messing with me. Like... Uh, you know, I'd just be walking along the side of the road, and, and the, ro- the shoulder is plenty big enough, but the, uh, the truckers, you know, they'd be driving along, and, you know, they'd see me walking and think, oh, let's let's have a little fun here, and let's see how close we can get the, to this guy before he, uh, before, before he freaks out and, and, you know, leaps off the road. And so there were a couple times where, you know, a trucker would try to <laughs> sideswipe me with his trailer, and, uh, you know, the trailer would end up three or four feet away from me, you know, at, at 60 miles an hour, it's kind of nerve wracking. And so I was on the road for, you know, seven and a half months and it was only three or four times that somebody tried to sideswipe me. The, the rest of the time it was just, you know, the dangers of walking along a highway. Nobody was trying to hit me with their car or anything. It looked like from reading your blog that people were very generous. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah, people were, were really generous. And, and uh, the just like, you know, on the second or third day of the walk, I had this really memorable kind of introductory experience of, you know, this is how it's going to be for the next seven months. And I was just walking along. And this guy, he was working, you know, some some Caterpillar brand, you know, heavy lifter con- roadway construction, you know, working on the other side of the road. And he sees me walking along. He jumps out of his uh, rig and practically got hit by the cars right, running across the road to greet me. He comes running over and he's all excited and he's waving at me and, and laughing and calling out. And he just came over to just to shake my hand and say hi. And, you know, then he invited me for tea. And so anyway, uh, I, this was just a first couple of days into the walk. And, and I knew that you know people were going to be very, you know, welcoming and friendly. Uh, But this was kind of, you know, it was early on in the walk. It was just the first couple of days. And it was just kind of an over on the top, you know, somebody hits you with the uh, in the head with a stick and says, this is how it's going to be. That kind of niceness continued for 
you know, the rest of the trip. People would invite me into their houses. They would give me food. I don't think I, I paid for tea for, uh, you know, for the entire half a year. Every time I would meet somebody and, and they, they would call me over and, and I'd have tea with them and just we'd just sit for a while and chat. There was one point where you wrote about you talked to a police officer. I think it was a police officer, and he gave you a, a piece of advice as you moved further east. Um, yeah, he said, "Don't." First of all, I remember it was something about don't sleep on the side of the road. <laughs> so I was wondering if how how did things change? Did did people change as you went from west to east? Yeah, uh, they, they changed a little bit. One of the uh, things that I kind of suspected in my gut uh, before the trip and saw confirmed on the trip was that things do change and people are different, but people tend to think that their differences are more significant than they really are. So as I moved east, people would be a little more skittish, you know, and and it would be skittish about being uh, a, a little more wary of strangers a little more suspicious and a little, yeah, a little more suspicious and a little more guarded. That kind of crazy openness that I saw, you know, when that guy early on in the walk ran across the road and, and just practically killed himself just coming over to say hello to me. I didn't see that much anymore in Eastern Turkey, but uh, still, even in Eastern Turkey, uh, you know, when people are saying, oh, you know, we're really skittish and and, uh, and suspicious around here. The truth is that they aren't really. And I was, still had no problem taking care of the, the basics of life, which was just meeting people and finding places to stay and finding food to eat and making new friends. You also mentioned that there were a lot of people that just couldn't believe that you were walking across Turkey. Yeah. How do you explain that? Well, I, I think uh, just statistically speaking, there aren't a whole lot of people who walk across Turkey. So when you, you meet somebody, uh, chances are that they will have not met somebody who's walking across Turkey before. So their reaction will be just one of surprise. Often, especially in the first half of the trip, uh, when I would tell people that I was walking across Turkey, they wouldn't really believe me. Uh, and so I wouldn't tell them that I was walking across Turkey. I would just tell them that I was walking to the next town. And they even had a hard time believing that. The, the other thing was, this came up uh, or as a recurring theme on your blog, is uh, this notion that you were a spy. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you explain that? Yeah. Well, uh, f- first off, pretty much all foreigners who uh, who who are in Turkey or live in Turkey get called spies. And, and I don't know, I don't, I, I still don't understand that. It's so illogical, uh, but it's just the way it is. Even here in Istanbul, uh, which is a long ways from the Middle East borders. And, uh, even here in Istanbul, uh, I get people figure I'm a spy and, and other people who are uh, other foreigners who, who live here in, in Turkey, or live here in Istanbul, they, people think they're spies. Uh, even my, my best friends who are completely fluent in English and uh, have spent more time living in the U.S. than, I will, than I've spent living in Turkey, uh, even they laugh when I tell them about this. And they say, well, yeah, but you know, at the back of my head, I think you're a spy too. <laughs> and uh, when something happens politically, like the, just the other day, the prime, there was there were some protests here in Istanbul recently, and um, the prime minister gave a speech where he said, you know, there are strangers and spies among us, and they were stirring up the uh, the, the protests. So it's just kind of uh, natural when you're a foreigner in Turkey to for people to suspect you're a spy. Um, but while I was walking, uh, I, I had a couple of funny run-ins with that. One was. Uh, I was out just hanging around one night uh, with some villagers and some some drunk young men came by. You know, they were, you know, in their late teens, early 20s. You know, they start, started having a conversation, you know, about 
not, not not just that I was a spy, but what kind of spy was I? Did I work for the CIA or did I work for Mossad or whatever? They, they kind of got angry, you know, because it kind of brings out this defensive, angry, nationalistic gene in people. So I, I kind of got afraid for a few moments, you know, wondering, oh, my God, you know, these guys are drunk. Their decision making is impaired. Are, are they going to throw me off the balcony or something? And uh, in the end, they were just, you know, having a good time and, and just bullshitting basically but then a couple other times when i was walking in the east near the town the city of, of shamla urfa uh, i stopped by at a, at a at a gasoline station one day you know for some uh, some water and some tea and something and i was sitting around with some of the farmers who were also just hanging out at the gasoline station uh, they said, oh, well, how do you travel? And I said, well, I just walk. And then I, I either sleep in people's houses or I sleep on the side of the road. And uh, they, then they asked, oh, what do you eat? And so I just said, well, I either eat in people's houses or I go to a restaurant. Or sometimes when all there is is a gasoline station, I just eat some junk food from the gasoline station. And they asked me again, yeah, so where do you sleep? And I said, well, sometimes I just sleep on the side of the road. And, and and they they nodded knowingly and said, "Yeah, you sleep on the road just like a spy." <laughs> yeah, I remember that part. That was funny. Yeah. So uh, and and I ran into that uh, periodically along the walk, and it's just a, it's just this weird thing that on the one hand you've got the the same people who will treat you incredibly well and give you the shirts off their backs will in the next sentence uh, say, "Well, you're probably a spy." And the two, I don't know, they just somehow, the, the juxtaposition is weird and it doesn't sound logical, but somehow those two sentiments just manage to live equally alive in the Turkish people. All right, I'm going to throw three questions at you now. The first question is, what was your high point of the trip? The second question is, what's the low point of the trip? Mm -hmm. The third question is, how do you keep up the motivation day to day? Those are good questions. Uh, okay, so high point of motivation during the trip. There were a couple. I had this this one experience where I was camping outside. I was camping out in a grove of trees by the side of the road. I was out in the middle of nowhere. There weren't there was weren't even any villages nearby. And there was a huge thunderstorm at night. And the thunder was just so loud and, and it cracked so violently that I, I was sure the trees were just going to crack and come crashing down on my tent at night. And then the, the storm passed and uh, I, I got up in the middle of the night. I stepped outside and, and th there was uh, some moonlight and the clouds were parting. And so the moonlight was coming through and it was just amazing. And I thought, oh my God, I'm so lucky to be seeing this right now. No one else gets to see this except for me. And the only reason I get to see it is because I've taken this huge leap of faith. And I've just, this leap of faith is that I'll be okay if I walk across the country. And so the, the, there, there were some times during the trip where I would get a view into nature that I would not get otherwise and that no one else was around to share with me. And I would just realize that, wow, the only reason that I'm getting to see this is because I have decided to walk across this country. Uh, and, and those were some of the, the high points for me. Other high points were, as I was finishing the walk, about a, a dozen friends from uh, Istanbul and Ankara and uh, other uh, Adana and other places around Turkey came to visit me for the walk. We met this uh, woman who was had ridden her bicycle across Turkey, and she was going to uh, ride her bicycle into Iran. She joined us for the last day of the walk, so there were some some social highlights too. Uh, and I remember, you know, seeing this this group of these twelve people, and they were really enjoying being with each other. And these were not people who would have anything to do with it, each other in in regular life, or at least some some of them weren't. And, and yet they were having this great time together. And I just and, and there was this woman who was going to ride her bicycle, you know, into Iran, which I admired greatly. And she was having a good time. And, and my friends were having a, a good time talking to her. And I just thought I, I just thought it was it was so nice to see that this group of people had gathered and were having an inspiring moment that they were going to remember for a long time. And 
it was they were doing they were gathering like this because I was walking across Turkey and there were those the, at those moments I would I would think even if there's only this one moment out of the whole trip if that's all I ever get this entire trip will be worth it just for that one moment so that was another high point uh, so there were nature natural high points and there were uh, some social high points some of the low points there were <laughs> there were a couple low points one of the lowest points was, or probably the lowest point, was early on in the walk, just after about two weeks, uh, I hurt my, my right foot, and I kind of thought that was over. You know, I had walked 1,200 miles before I came to Turkey. I kind of thought that, you know, my body wasn't going to have any more problems anymore, but boom, all of, out of nowhere, here was my, my right foot, and it was hurting so bad that I couldn't even, you know, walk across the street. Uh, I, I couldn't step at all without limping. It was it was horrible. And I thought, oh, I'm not going to be able to finish the walk. And here I am two weeks into it. And I might be I might not be able to finish it. And what the hell am I going to do? I was absolutely terrified. I checked into a, a motel that I, I found by the side of the road. And I just remember laying there on the bed, you know, with my feet elevated against the wall. And I was just thinking, oh, my God, what am I going to do? I kind of knew in my gut that somehow you're going to have to figure this one out uh, and you will figure it out and you'll make it across the country. But I had no idea how that was going to happen. Another low point uh, for me across the walk, it actually, it was a very social event. You know, I was meeting people all the time, but I didn't meet them for very long. At the most, maybe I would see them for a couple of days. And so I was getting really lonely. And, and I missed my friends and I missed my family back home in the U.S. And I, I was sitting at a, a, a some restaurant in Gaziantep, you know, in, in kind of southeastern Turkey. I was having some soup for breakfast and they had in the restaurant had the news on. And I was just so I was just kind of watching the news out of the corner of my eye. And, and I don't remember what it was. It was just some some story you know, that you see on the news, you know, a, a gazillion times a day. And. Something about that story just triggered me, and I, I just felt so lonely. I was practically sitting there crying in my soup. Um, <laughs> and uh, I thought, pull yourself together, man, because A, you, you've got you know still a third of the country to walk across, and B, it's going to be tremendously embarrassing if you start crying into your soup. So you know, pull yourself together. Uh, so there were definitely some high points and some, some low points along the walk. How important was it to be able to speak some Turkish? Uh, it, it was it was very important, uh, especially in the first half. Uh, in the second half of the trip, I, I changed where I stayed at night, and I started using couch surfing. And the, you know, the couch surfing community is is much more English friendly, so I used a lot more English uh, for on the second half of the trip. But on the first half of the trip, I didn't use any English much at all. And and actually, for the first two months, I don't think I had even one conversation in English. And my, my Turkish isn't really that advanced. It, it's it's very basic. You know, just, hey, how's it going? I call it, it's, it's Tarzan Turkish. It's grammatically not correct. Uh, the vocabulary is very limited. You're just kind of using a club to, you know, <laughs> get, using the language like a club to get what you need. Uh, but even being being able to do that is very important because you know, I was out in uh, in areas where you know, people don't don't speak anything except Turkish. And uh, so being able to uh, communicate with them, you know, knowing some Turkish would be the only way that I could do it. Matt, tell me about your couch surfing experience. Well, for the uh, for the second half of the walk, I uh, stayed mostly in people's houses. And uh, most of the time, so, sometimes I knew the people I was staying with. I was staying with old friends, but most of the time I didn't know who I was staying with. And so I used couch surfing. And, and the reason that I made that switch was back in early December when I was about 40% of the way through the walk, I realized, oh my God, this is so lonely. I don't like, I'm not having a good time. I mean, I, I am having a good time. This is amazing, but I'm really lonely and it's, it's just grinding away at me. What can I do? And so, uh, I had a friend who had done some traveling on couch surfing before and he traveled around the world. He's a Turkish guy and he had traveled around the world on couch using couch surfing. And so I, I had never tried couch surfing and I thought, well, I'll try that. 
So I used that uh, starting out in, in Mersin, which is along the Mediterranean coast. And I, for about uh, 60% of the time after that, or maybe even more, I used couch surfing to find, you know, to find hosts in a, in a town where I was, would be walking near. And I met some of the most amazing people through that. Uh, another thing about uh, traveling or with couch surfing for me was that you know, the couch surfing uh, community is much more English friendly in that they are more knowledgeable with English. So whereas before, you know, for the first half of the trip, I really didn't have any substantial conversations at all because my Turkish is so, so limited. In the second half of the trip, I got to have lots of very substantial conversations because they were in English. And, you know, I'm a native speaker and, and uh, the people I was talking with speak, spoke very good English. And so at the beginning, when uh, I started using couch surfing, uh, I thought, whoa, this, this, I don't know about this. Uh, it, am I going to find out a couple you know, weeks down the road that this is kind of cheating? And what I found was that I actually loved the experience because I got to meet people a whole lot better. And I got to stay in their houses and, you know, have dinner with them and meet their friends and meet their family. And I was staying with some teachers uh, many times. And so I would get to go visit their schools and visit their students, visit their workplace. So I, I highly recommend when you're out traveling, hotels are nice and all, but uh, try some couch surfing. And, you know, couch surfing is very heavy on demographically skewed towards people in their, you know, in their early to mid 20s. But, you know, I'm 43. So I was twice as old as some of the people I was staying with. But I still had a great time and met a lot of great people. So I highly recommend, you know, when you're out traveling the world, just try out couch surfing. You don't even have to be traveling the world, just traveling to a different city Try in your own country. Try out couch surfing. Now, isn't part of couch surfing that you have to reciprocate? You don't have to reciprocate, uh, as in. Uh, well, you don't have. So you stayed at people's places. Do people? Do you have to offer up your place to people? Oh, uh, no, you don't. And uh, it's it's kind of you know it's the couch surfing culture to uh, it's the culture of the community to reciprocate in some way, and one of the ways of reciprocation is you know to open up your home after your travels, or before your travels. But the couch surfing website and the couch surfing community of people uh, understand that, you know, that doesn't always work out logistically. So there are plenty of other ways that you can reciprocate. And uh, s some of those ways are just, you know, if somebody offers their home to you, just, uh, you know, cook them dinner or, or take them out to dinner or, you know, buy them a beer. You know, when you're back in your hometown after your trip, there, there are some couch surfing, you know, group meetings, like, you know, once a week or once a month, you know, people get together and have a beer and, and just join those groups. And the having people stay in your house before or after the trip is just one of the ways of, of reciprocating. And I, one, one thing that really impressed me about the couch surfing community is that the, the motivation for people to open their homes is not in a pay it forward because I might need someone to open their home to me in the future sort of thing. It's just for some reason, these people just like having strangers come into their lives and they're trusting people who have strangers stay in their homes and they get enough out of that. Just so if you're nice to them and if you, you know, buy them dinner or buy them a beer and just swap stories, that's all they need. Uh, that's all the reciprocation that they expect or want. Good advice. Yeah. So you make it to the end. Mm -hmm. What is the significance of the breaking of the bottles? Ah, okay. Well, I broke the bottles on the last day, and I, I broke three of them. You know kind of how, uh, you know, when you christen a ship, you uh, break a bottle of champagne against the ship. It was, it was kind of like that for me. Uh, I broke the bottles on the side of the road uh, just because I, I kind of it wasn't the beginning of the trip. It was the end of the trip. But I wanted to christen the end of the trip. And th there were three bottles. One was for my parents. One was for uh, a man named Frank Kleist, who is the father of a high school friend of mine. Uh, that friend has since passed away, but I still keep in touch with the father. And uh, 
who was the third one for? I have it written down. Oh, okay. A, a friend of mine from, from university, uh, from college, uh, Christian Strack, who lives in California now. These just were three people who, for various reasons, were important for me during the walk or have been important to me throughout my life. I was breaking those bottles simply because I wanted to celebrate the end of the walk. Those bottles, they uh, they didn't br- break easily. I, I actually had to throw rocks on, on, on them to break them uh, because I, I thought that they were going to break easy because they were glass, but they didn't. And they weren't champagne because I just, you know, kind of got them spur of the moment. They were like sparkling apple cider or something like that. But I just needed some some bottles to break uh, near the border. Now, speaking of this sort of dedication to people, mm. at, the, at the start of every day, you do the little photo with uh, yeah. this day is for. How did that yeah. idea come about? Uh, that idea came about when I was still in in the U.S. And when one day I was out walking in the morning, you know, doing my morning for four hours of walking. I thought, oh, you know, I, I, I'm doing a lot of work to prepare for this a walk. And during the walk, I'm going to do a lot of work. And I don't want to just keep that work for myself. Uh, I, I want to have another purpose. And it's kind of lonely out here walking. Even, even when I was walking in, in California, it was kind of lonely. And uh, so, you know, I looked to people for inspiration, you know, just to get through the next day, to get through the next hour of walking. And I thought, well, I need to acknowledge those people uh, and I need to let those people know that they may not even remember me, but m- most, m- many of them, it turns out, do did. But uh, th- I was thinking it doesn't matter if they remember me or not. I, I, want, I just want to thank them. I want to acknowledge them for providing me with some grain of strength somewhere that's going to help me somewhere in life. I may not see them for years or may not have seen them for years, but uh, – uh, they need to know that that they are affecting the world around them, and so that's uh, what those the, what those daily dedications uh, came from. Matt, what's your advice for anybody that wants to undertake a challenge like this? Uh, my advice is is do it. Uh, wh- whatever whatever challenge you have, and, you know my my challenge was I want to walk across the country. There are a gazillion other kinds of challenges, and everybody has one of their own and and they're all you know different in some way do it that's my advice and and it will be tremendously disruptive to your life Uh, you will probably uh, not be able to continue living the life that you have lived before and your life will not be the same afterwards you will probably want to go do something else Uh, do it anyway Uh, you know when you're on your deathbed you're not going to say thank god i never pursued my dream you're going to you're going to say damn it why didn't i pursue my dream and another thing another reason that i i, I just tell i tell people just do it is uh, there there are a lot of people who want to change their life in some way there are some people who don't but most people do want to change their life in some way and after doing the walk i one of the things that i kind of learned on the walk was that uh, if you want to change your life and if you want to change the lives of the people around you. You don't have to really understand why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, if you have a big project, you don't have to sit around trying to figure out why you want to do it. Um, you don't have you don't have to understand why you want to do it. After I walked across Turkey, I still don't know why I walked across Turkey. <laughs> uh, but simply by uh, pursuing a project that is too big. Uh, you will change your life and the lives of others around you. And there are a lot of people who will find inspiration from seeing another person pursue his dream. And so you may not understand why you're doing it, and you may not understand, you probably won't understand how it's going to change your life, but it will simply by pursuing something that is too big for you to understand. So, and I highly recommend that you just, whatever that is for you, that you just do it. Matt, what's next for you? Uh, well, right now for, for the next, next half year is is kind of my immediate concerns. I'll be, uh, I'm I'm writing a book about the, the walk across Turkey 
and I finished the trip completely broke. So, uh, so, you know, making some money, relining my pockets, getting the book written. Those, those are my Im- immediate projects. My longer term project uh, is I would like to walk across Iran. That's not going to happen until 2014 at best. So, um, you know, I still have another year or, or so before that. And uh, longer term, you know, I'd like to I'd like to have a family and I'd like to be married again and I'd like to have kids. And um, I don't know how I'm going to fit that in with walking across Iran and stuff. But, you know, whatever, I'll figure that out later. But for for the for right now, I'm just kind of, you know, just get the book written, pay your rent, make some money, line your pockets. That's that's kind of what I'm doing right now. I'm assuming at one point in time you you must have worked in a cubicle. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Are you ever going to be able to go back? No. I in 2009 when I went back to the U.S. I was trying to do that again, uh, just because that was you know the way that I knew I, I knew that I could make some money and I knew that I could find a job and I knew I could you know get a house and provide for a family by doing that. So it was what I it was something I knew, and so. I went back and I tried to do that again and I was just miserable doing it. And I remembered that, you know, when I came to Turkey back in 2002 and 2003, I had left that world because I didn't like it. So I saw again, I didn't like it again. I still didn't like it. So I know that if I went back and did it again now, I would, I still wouldn't like it. It's just not going to happen for me. You know, that saying, uh, uh, about how you know you, you jump off a cliff and then figure out how to build your wings on the way down. Sure, I like that way of life, and uh, is not just not just walking across Turkey. Walking across Turkey was that for me, but I had done that you know a half dozen other times in in my life before that, and I just uh, had kind of been realizing lately that I just like that, and that's how I enjoy living. So uh, if if some someday if I need to have a job working in a cubicle, uh, so that I you know if, if that fits in well with with building my wings on my way down, then yeah, I'll probably do that because uh, my primary love is you know building my wings on the way down. That's bigger than my dislike of working in a cubicle. But I'm I don't hanker for the days or ache to find a job where you know I get to sit working in a cubicle. And come home at night watching TV. So yeah, chan- chances are that I probably won't do that again. Well, Matt Krause, how can people get in touch with you? Well, I've got uh, a couple ways, and, and I, I'm an easy guy to find. Um, I, I have a website, a personal website, uh, mattkrause.com, and I've had that for you know ten years. And it just I, whatever I'm doing at the time, that's my main you know home base for keeping in touch with people. So that's my main website, mattkraus.com. Uh, heathenpilgrim.com was just a website that I opened uh, short term uh, for a year or so while I was to chronicle the walk across Turkey. Uh, but that now uh, currently has many links back to my main website, mattkraus.com. So you can send me an email at either address. They all come to the same place. And my email address is mattkraus at mattkraus.com. Or you can you know, call me on my cell phone. Uh, that number is also on my website. Or you can find me on the street. I, I often you know, chronicle my location at any given time. So I'm a pretty easy guy to find. Well, Matt Kraus, thank you very much for your time. Uh, congratulations on your accomplishment. I wish you well on your future journeys. And I'm looking forward to hearing about this walk across Iran. I hope you make it, and I hope we can talk again. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Paul. You're welcome. Recorded June 27, 2013. To hear more great podcasts, visit thepursuitzone.com.